Reading practice. Improve your pronunciation in English. Sunshine. Chapter 27. A hiss. I'd heard Conhis vampires did hiss. The giggler had hissed. It was a horrible noise even from a, an everyday, an every night vampire. It was much worse from Bo, as everything about Bo was worse. But was it a hiss? Or was it his attempt to say my name? I was back at the lake, where it all began. The sun flamed outside the house. The lake water lapped at the shore. For that first time I heard my tree, yes. Perhaps there had been a doe standing in that forest, looking through the trees at the house, on her way home, to some dappled place where she would doze till sunset. By regard. I shouted. I destroy you and I put my hands into the mire of his chest, and wrenched out his heart. The sky was falling. Ah. Okay. Skies don't fall, therefore I was dead. I'd kind of expected to be dead. I felt rather comfortable, really. Relieved. Did that mean I'd succeeded? Succeeded in what? There'd been something I'd been desperate to do before I checked out for the last time, couldn't quite remember. Why can't you leave me alone? There is a lot of noise. Shouldn't be able to hear anyone saying my name. So, I'm not hearing someone saying my name. So go away, damn it. I don't want to be here, shivering in this polluted body. My hands, my hands, touched, I won't remember. I'm not dead yet, I thought composedly, but I am dying. Good. I don't want to spend the rest of my life being careful not to remember. I hope I did whatever it was I wanted to do first. Maybe I could go back just long enough to find out. Con, on his hands and knees, crouched over me. The floor shook under us, and there was a lot of stuff falling down and flying around. Not a good place to be, unless you were dying, which I was. Con, I wanted to say, don't bother. Let one of these flying chunks of something or other finish the job. I'm tired, and I don't want to hang around. My hands. Sunshine, he said. We have to get out of here. Listen to me. You have undone Bo. He cannot put himself back together. You have succeeded. This is your victory. But there is much of his, his animus released by the final destruction of his body. This place is being pulled to pieces. I cannot carry you through this. Sunshine, listen to me. I was drifting off again. I paused in the drift, momentarily caught by the sound of Con's voice. He sounded positively, emotional. I wanted to laugh, but I didn't have the energy. I began to drift again. I felt him lift me up, I wanted to struggle, leave me alone, but I didn't have the energy for that either. He rearranged me, leaning against him, one arm around me, the other hand cradling my head tipping it toward his body. 
blood, blood in my mouth, again, no, I wanted to struggle, I did want to, I could have not swallowed, I could have let it run back out of my mouth again, Con's blood, this wasn't the blood of a deer, this time, a mortal creature, killed for me, killed because she was like me, more like me than a vampire, less like me than a vampire, perhaps, by the fact of her death, by the fact that the recently life-worn blood of her had saved my life, that had been a long time ago, I hadn't known what was going on, that time, I knew well enough this time, this was Con's heart's blood, the heart's blood of a vampire. When did I cross the irrevocable line, when I drove out to the lake, when I tucked my little knife into my bra, when I transmuted it into a key, when I unlocked my shackle, when I unlocked Con's. When I took him into the daylight, and stopped it from burning him. When he saved my life by the death of a doe. When I discovered I could destroy a vampire with my hands. When I destroyed Bo with those hands. Or when I agreed to live, by drinking Con's heart's blood. I don't know what happened at the foot of the dais, when Bo's crack troop set on Con while I was climbing the stairs. I don't know if what I saw was entirely some mirage of Bo's, to confound and weaken me, or whether something like it did happen. I would rather think that some of it did happen. That the wound in his chest was already there when he pressed my mouth against it. This was no mere flesh wound, this time, no tiny slash from a tiny blade. I did not want to think of him sinking his own fingers, tearing his own. I lifted my head with a gasp, and began to struggle to my feet. He eeled up beside me, still that vampire fluency, even after everything that had happened even with that wound in his chest. He took my hand again, and we ran. It takes some coordination, running while holding someone's hand, but if you can get it right, every time your linked hands swing forward you get a little extra force for that stride. Some of that was the vampire cocktail I had just swallowed, it coursed through me giving me a strength I knew didn't belong to me, shouldn't belong to me, shouldn't be letting me keep struggling, letting me run, letting me use my poisoned hands. Clinging to his hand too, or perhaps his clinging to mine, let me stop thinking about what my hands had recently been doing. So, would it have been better to die? Too much has happened since my last sunset. Con may be right that I cannot be turned, and that it won't be the daylight that kills me, but the touch of the real world will, whatever the sun is doing. I missed the little hot lump of the seal against my leg. The chain swept back and forth across my breast in time with my running footsteps, but slowly, weighted by the thick poisoned blood of the reopened scar. My sun self, my tree self, my dear self. Don't they outweigh the dark self? Not anymore. We ran, and a wind like the end of the world howled around us, and huge fragments of machinery, having crumbled apart and fallen, were yanked up again and tossed like bits of paper. I think the roof was caving in as well, it was a little hard to differentiate. There was no trail to follow, 
of dismembered vampire remains or anything else. I don't know how Con knew which way to run, but he seemed to, and I ran because he was running, because it seems like a good thing to do when hunks of flying metal the size of small buses are razoring through the air around you, even though I suppose you're as likely to run into the wrong place at the wrong time as you are to have lingered in the wrong place at the wrong time if you were moving more slowly. For the moment, for just this moment of running, I seem to be committed to the idea of trying to stay alive. Then we were actually running down something that looked like a corridor, towards something that looked like double swinging doors. We put our unlinked hands forward to push through, and for a miracle the door swung back, like normal doors in the real world are supposed to do. We were outside, outside, in no town, under a night sky, breathing real air. Maybe I didn't have time to die, when I ran back into the real world. Or maybe I was too surprised. We ran straight into the arms of a division of SOF. In a way I was lucky. They recognized me almost immediately. I was hysterical, this was definitely one thing too many, and when I got grabbed by three guys I did one of them some damage before the other two got a bind on me. I couldn't bear the touch of well, of flesh against mine, especially against my hands, so it's a good thing they had a bind ready rather than the old-fashioned routine of spread out on the ground with my hands twisted up behind my back. The bind should have stopped me cold, but I was still full of adrenaline, or dark blood, or the remains of the strength the light web had gathered for me, or poison, or whatever you like, and I thrashed and squirmed like someone having a fit for a minute or two before it stopped me. By which time I'd heard a half-familiar voice say, Wait a minute, isn't that, that's Ray, from Charlie's, remember, she. You have to hand it to the SOF training drill. A madwoman covered in blood runs out of nowhere, promptly tries to maim one of your teammates, and then goes off in fits, and this guy had enough presence of mind to make an ID. And then a completely familiar voice, now kneeling beside me as I panted inside the fully expanded bind, saying, Sunshine. Sunshine. Can you hear me? I could. Just. His voice sounded like it was coming through a filter, or a bad phone connection, which might have been the bind. I don't think it was, but it might have been. The person saying sunshine, can you hear me, was Pat. I nodded. I wasn't ready to try and say anything. I'm not sure a nod from a person in a bind is very recognizable, but Pat got it. I can let you out of the bind if you promise if you're okay now. I thought about it. I was lying on the ground. A good bind will prevent you hurting yourself as well as hurting anyone else, and I didn't seem a whole lot worse than I'd been before SOF grabbed me. And from inside a bind you don't have any responsibilities. Did I want to be let out? Gods and angels, what was happening to Con? SOF knew me, they might listen to me. I couldn't do con any good foaming at the mouth and being a loony. Couldn't afford to die yet either. First I owed it to him to get him out of this. If they hadn't staked him already. Urgency shot through me, tying some of the scattered bits of my personality and will together again. Granny knots probably, but hey.
I said as calmly as I could, yes. Okay. I'm a little dizzy. Pat patted the bind where my shoulder was, and then pulled its plug. It twumped and collapsed. He made to take my arm, help me to stand up, but I flinched away, saying, please don't touch me. He nodded, but I could see he was worried the way I must look would worry anyone and the way the little ring of SOFs around us moved, they were ready to drop me again at the first sign of new trouble. I turned slowly around, I was dizzy, and I didn't want anyone alarmed into doing something I would regret and looked for Con. He'd apparently taken capture more quietly. He was standing, watching me. They had handcuffs on him. Handcuffs. You don't handcuff a vampire, well, there are sucker cuffs, but these were ordinary ones. From where I stood I didn't think there were even any ward signs on them. A vampire could break out of ordinary cuffs like a human might break out of a donut. I'm not usually a very good liar. Whatever I'm thinking shows on my face. I hoped it wasn't on my face hey you halfwits you've put cuffs on a vampire. I hope I only looked confused and dizzy. I certainly felt confused and dizzy. You okay? I managed. Con nodded. He looked a little peculiar, but it had been a peculiar evening. Friend of yours? Pat asked neutrally. I nodded. They must have seen us running. I turned to look at what, where, whatever we had run from. I'd registered that we were in no town. We were in what remained of somewhere in no town. A lot of it seemed to be lying in pieces on the ground around us. The doors would run through lead from a building that ended in a jagged diagonal rake of broken wall about eight feet above the doors at its lowest point. There was no roof. Neither of the buildings on each side had any roof left either. One of them still had some of its front wall standing, which was nearly as tall as I was, the other one had a bit of side wall still in one piece. Not a very large piece. I turned back to Pat. What happened? He almost smiled. I was hoping you might be able to tell me. Since you're, uh, here. We got a report that it was raining, um, body parts, in no town. Really freaked some of the clubbers. We sent out a car to take a look and they were radioing for help before they arrived. By the time we got here it was raining exploded buildings as well. And more body parts. The, uh, body parts appear to be vampire. Ex-vampire, as you might say. The ones we've had a closer look at. I nodded. I glanced again at Con. My brain was slowly beginning to function. I realized that the reason Con looked peculiar was because he was passing. Don't ask me how he was doing it. But SOF thought he was human. I can take the cuffs off your friend too, if you say you know him, Pat said, a little too neutrally. He was a little upset, when you, uh, went nuts, I supplied. Sorry. Pat looked at me. I saw it registering with him that the way I looked, whatever had caused it, I had reason to be a little on edge. He looked away again, 
and nodded, and someone stepped forward and released Con. He joined Pat and me. The circle of SOFs unobtrusively rearranged itself again to keep us under guard. Pat the lion tamer, in with the lions. Con moved a little stiffly, like a man who'd had a hard night. Or like a vampire trying to look human. He looked a lot better than he had the afternoon we'd had to walk back from the lake. He didn't look like anyone you'd want to take home to meet the family, but he didn't look like a mad junkie either. Or a vampire. And I didn't look like anyone you'd want to take home to meet the family. We were both beat up, ragged, blood-saturated, and filthy, and my nose was as stunned as the rest of me, but I guess we stank. Con's black shirt stuck to his body in such a way I couldn't see the wound in his chest. If it was still there. My own breast ached and burned, but if I was still bleeding, it had slowed to an ooze. I crossed my arms, but with my elbows well in front of my body, so that my hands hung loosely from my wrists out to either side, without touching any of the rest of me. I wasn't remembering any more of what had happened than I had to, but I knew there was something wrong with my hands. I wondered where Con had picked up passing for human in the last five months. Was that one of the things I had given him, the night he had given me dark sight? Or was he taking his cue off our jailers somehow? Not that anybody had said they were our jailers. Yet. I didn't want to say anything like, can we go home now, in case they did. Besides, I didn't know that I wanted to go home. I didn't know that I wanted to do anything. My pulse seemed to throb in my hands. There was a tinny buzzing from someone's radio wire, Pat's. I saw his expression get grimmer, and it had been pretty grim already. Yeah. Okay. No, my guess is things are going to stay quiet now. Yeah, I'll leave a few to keep an eye out, and you can send any clean-up crew you can find. Yeah. He looked at me. Deputy Exec Jine wants to debrief you. My heart sank. The goddess of pain. And you don't debrief civilians. You and Mr. Pat turned politely to Con. Connor, Con replied. Mr. Connor. You and Sunshine can ride back in my car, and Sunshine can tell you a little about our deep ex -gine. I almost managed to be amused. The intrusive presence of the goddess had just put Pat on our side. I guessed we'd need him there. The effort to be amused faded, leaving cold exhaustion. Pat did the best he could for us. The goddess wasn't going to wait for us to have showers, let alone food and sleep. I would have liked to see Con in one of their fuzzy khaki jammy suits though. Pat radioed ahead from the car and Theo and John met us with blankets and tea. I wondered who got to hose down the inside of the car. We were also offered the opportunity to have a pee. Such magnanimity. I accepted. Con did not. Don't vampires pee? It had been one thing on the walk back from the lake when he'd been on short rations for a long time. Okay, do they have a digestive system? 
Maybe it all goes straight into, never mind. At least I could wash my hands, although I felt the soap only slide over what I most needed to scour away. I cleaned my face with a paper towel, so my hands never touched anything but paper. Con hesitated no more than a moment when offered tea or coffee, and chose tea. He wrapped the blanket around himself. It was yellow, and didn't help his complexion. He was impressive as a vampire but mostly just ugly as a human. There was a kind of threateningness to his ugliness but you couldn't have said why. There was a study once about whether ugly or good-looking people are more imposing. Generally the uglier you are the less imposing, till you reach a sort of nadir of ugliness and then you get really imposing. I thought Con just missed the nadir. Just. He was also shorter as a human. I didn't get this at all. But if it meant the goddess would underestimate him that would be expedient. Possibly even life-saving. Although I wasn't sure how I felt about going on having my life repeatedly saved. My thoughts were moving slowly and indistinctly, and they stumbled a lot. I'd had to take the tea mug into my hands to drink from it, but I kept my fingers well away from the brim where my lips would touch. They offered us food, but I refused, it would be sandwiches, something you'd have to touch with your hands. And my refusal made Con's look less odd, maybe. When Pat took us up to the goddess office, there were seven of us. Pat, Con and me, Theo and John and two people I didn't know beyond occasionally seeing them at Charlie's, Kate and Mike. The goddess wanted to dismiss everyone but Con and me, she had her own people present, of course, but Pat, going all formal, declined to be dismissed, and began reeling off some directive or other. I'd heard him asking for some SOF reg book and seen him poring over it in the little turnaround time between the car and the goddess office, but I hadn't thought about it. He was now proving that since he'd nabbed us in the field, he was responsible for us, even in the presence of a superior officer, because he was a field specialist and she wasn't, and the situation was insecure. One for Pat. But the lines around the goddess mouth got harder, and her mouth more pinched. And we were all going to pay for it. Mainly she went for Con. Because she knew there was something wrong about him. Or because he was the stranger. If she hadn't done it before I skegged the HQ com system, she would have read any available file on me after, which wasn't a happy thought, especially the presumption that it would get fatter as a result of her interest. I wondered if Yolanda could make a ward against SOF for collecting techniques. A ward that didn't proclaim itself as a ward, that only made me look boring. Because my natural boringness would have taken a fatal injury tonight. Nobody, certainly not Pat or the goddess, was going waste any more time believing my story about having blown myself out the night I blew out their comm system. But there I went again, planning as if I had a future, and I hadn't decided about that yet. The future would be difficult without usable hands, and the old wound on my breast, but I wanted to get Con out of here. His future was his business. There were more voices. The goddess voice made my head ache. I had to listen, to pay attention, and I had to think, to be careful, to be ready, ready, 
The effort was making me start to disintegrate again. I was drifting. It was so much easier to drift. What is your name? Asked the goddess. Connor, Con replied. First name? Malcolm. And you live? I have only recently come to this area, and have not yet decided if I am staying. I rather think that I am not. But your local address? I am renting a house by the lake. Loud intake of breath from everyone except me and Con. No one lives by the lake anymore, said the goddess, as if she had caught him out in a lie. Con shrugged gently. Yes, my rent is very reasonable, and I like the solitude. There was a momentary pause. It was true that nobody lived by the lake anymore, but there wasn't a good reason why not. There were bad spots, but there were bad spots everywhere, and there were perfectly good not bad spots by the lake too. The goddess might think no human could bear the hauntedness of the lake, but she couldn't nail him as an unregistered part blood or illegal other on it. Let alone a vampire. And my little trouble five months ago had been the first of its kind in years. Con's choice of location would bring that trouble to mind, of course, but there wasn't any way that my presence in the middle of whatever had happened tonight wasn't going to bring that trouble back to center focus in everyone's mind. Maybe Con even had a plan. Which was a lot more than I had. I wanted to rub my aching head but I didn't want to use my hands. Who is your landlord? I do not know. I pay the rent to a post office box in Raindance. The rental was arranged through an agent. What agent? I do not remember. The papers are at home. You could produce the papers. Yes. What brought you to this area? It's natural beauty. That stopped her for a moment. She wasn't a trees and sunsets sort of person. I wondered vaguely where she lived. She wasn't a downtown high-rise sort of person either. Nor could I see her in grotty unorthodox old town. I couldn't see her redoing one of the houses in White Oak. I couldn't see her as a person with a life. I imagined her spending her off-duty hours folded up in a drawer. If she had any off-duty hours. What do you do for a living? I am fortunate in not having to work for a living. This startled her well. He hadn't been found in circumstances conducive to guessing he was a member of the independently wealthy, but you could see her shift her view to relishing despising this already suspicious character now revealed as a parasite on the body of society. A mosquito or a leech or something bloodsucking. Ha! And how then do you support yourself? My father left me comfortably off. And your father was... Sunshine. Chapter 28 He dealt in rare and valuable objects. She was hoping she'd got him. 
or soon would. What kind of rare and valuable objects? Con shrugged again, gently. Anything he could buy and sell. Jewelry, bric-a-brac, other ornaments. Small things mostly. Sometimes paintings, sculpture, larger furniture. He was very clever at it. I thought of his earth place, and wondered if he was plugging in his master in the necessary role of human father. I wondered if his earth place was anywhere near the lake. I wondered if vampires also felt that the best lies stick as near to the truth as possible, because it'll be easier remembering later what you said. I wondered if vampires really shrugged, or if this was verisimilitude, like having a father. He did it pretty well. The cross-examination went on. I wondered how much Con knew about human law. He could protest being held without explanation. He could protest the questioning. Perhaps he didn't want to. Perhaps staying human was enough of an effort, and he wasn't going to make waves. Perhaps he didn't mind. He certainly gave no impression of minding. I told myself that he was a vampire, and vampires don't give the impression of minding things, perhaps even when they are pretending to be human. It didn't occur to me that I might protest being held without explanation. I didn't want to encourage them to think about why they might want to hold me. It seemed to me they had too many good choices. But with a sudden cold drench of anti-disintegration fear I wondered what time it was. How long had we been occupied with Bo and his gang? It had still been deep dark when we'd run through those doors and straight into the SOF div waiting, presumably inadvertently, for us. But which end of the night was that deep dark? And how long had we been here? When was sunrise? When the goddess started asking me questions I had to come back a long way to focus on her words, to try to answer her. I was too shattered to be frightened at the same time as I was too shattered to be anything but frightened, to be able to think of a story to tell her, since I couldn't tell her the truth. In theory I had a lot less to lose than Con but it didn't feel like it. I mean, all I'd done was destroy some vampires. Maybe I hadn't gone through the proper channels, but nailing vampires is always a plus. She should pin a medal on me. I didn't think she was going to. Watch your back, sunshine. When Con and I had planned our confrontation with Bo, we hadn't thought about what happened after. Well, he may have, but if he had, he hadn't let me in on it. He wasn't a big talker. Also, after Bo, assuming that there was an after Bo, our reason for alliance was over, he probably hadn't thought there was anything to discuss. I sure hadn't thought about needing a good cover story. Who investigates the extermination of vampires? If we escaped, we'd be escaped, and it'd be over with. Of course we hadn't planned on blowing up no town. The thought returned, after bow, if there was an after bow. There would be no reason for Con and me to have anything more to do with each other. The goddess was talking to me. Yes, Mr. Connor and I had met five months ago, during my hour involuntary incarceration at the lake. No, I hadn't mentioned him before. 
Yes, perhaps I should have. But I had wanted to forget everything about that time, and I had not guessed I would meet him again. No, our meeting tonight was not planned, but no doubt it had something to do with our being drawn back, together, by the vampire we had escaped from those months ago. With crushing scorn the goddess declared, people don't escape from vampires. I had my one great moment then. I said that I guessed the vampire must have planned for us to escape, because it wanted to pull us back again later, after we thought we were safe. Even the goddess had to pause. I didn't think vampires played cat and mouse with their victims to such an extent as to let them run around loose for several months before putting a paw over them again but vampires are indisputably unpredictable. And it may be made a sort of teeny sense out of my comp system exploding habits. Then how, she said between her teeth, do you explain how you escaped this time? All due respect, m, said Pat, crisp and formal, not sounding like Pat at all, some big sucker gang war obviously. These two in the wrong place at the wrong time. Might explain how they got away last time too, some kind of sting, maybe. And why didn't we know about a gang war important enough to raise better than a third of no town? Snarled the goddess. Don't know, said Pat but we're going to find out. The goddess' next few questions to me were positively gentle. No, I couldn't remember how I, how we'd escaped, five months ago. I didn't precisely remember that we'd escaped at all. The entire experience was very blurred in my memory. Shock no doubt. Ask Pat. I told him as much as I remembered. I guessed I remembered even less now. She didn't ask Pat. She'd read the file. She didn't mention the other night, and the circumstances under which I'd met her the first time. This should have felt like a respite. It didn't. She turned back to Con. What did he remember of the two days he'd spent chained up in the house by the lake? Or perhaps it had been more than two days in his case. No, he didn't remember it very well either. He thought it might have been longer than two days. He thought he remembered the young lady being brought in after him. He had been hiking, and had planned to be away from home for some time anyway. No, he didn't remember precisely how long he was gone. He had spent several days after he returned in something of a daze. He lived alone and had, thanks to his father's bequest, few responsibilities. No one had missed him. He had contacted no one after his ordeal. No, he apologized, it had not occurred to him to make a report to SOF either. He understood he should have. He would be happy to make a full report now, yes, but there wasn't much report to give. He remembered so little. No, it hadn't put him off living by the lake. He lived by a different part of the lake. And where was that again? On the southwest side. Near No Town. Not very near. The goddess let this pass, maybe because it was true. But then she began on this evening's events. Con was very sorry but he didn't remember them clearly either. 
The notorious vampire glamour, he suggested, had confused him. He must remember something. He remembered standing at his front door, breathing the autumn-scented air, and watching the sun set. He must remember more than that. Con paused and looked thoughtful. He did this very well, understated but clear. Like the tone of his voice, not inscrutable vampire but reserved human male. Reticent as opposed to undead. He could have a great future in the theatre, so long as no one expected him to do matinees. He remembered a great deal of confusion, and fear, and pain, and a blood. He touched his blood-stiffened hair apologetically. And explosions. At some point he discovered Miss Seddon there with him amid the uh, uproar. He did not remember any other humans present, but he had not been looking for them. He had been looking for a way out, as had Miss Seddon. Naturally. Con closed his eyes momentarily at this point. I almost wanted to tell him not to overdo it. Naturally, said the goddess dryly. Mr. Connor, you seem to be taking all the uproar, as you put it, very calmly. Con spread his hands and smiled faintly. He smiled. Really? It is over now, he said. What would you have me do? I would have you tell me the truth. She shouted. I jumped in my seat. I hadn't been watching her. I'd been watching Con and the window blind. It was hard to see much, the blind was closed, the proof glass behind it would dull any light trying to come through it and the goddess office was brightly lit. But I was pretty sure the corners of the windows were a paler grey than they'd been when we came in. I looked at the goddess. I tried to look into the glaring shadows on her face, but I was very tired, and the shadows were layers thick. I could see nothing through them except more shadows. My head throbbed. But I could see her eyes. I didn't like what I saw. She couldn't have guessed, could she? She couldn't. What was there in some secret SOF archive? About vampires? About vampire-human alliances? Watch your back, sunshine. Why would she be watching me? What was there in my file that had caught her eye? Something important enough to lay a fetch on me for. Something she had, after all, picked up during her illegal troll of me the night we met. Was she trolling me now? My head hurt so much I couldn't tell how much of it was her god's awful aura and how much was just the way I was feeling. Had she tried to troll Con? If she had no, wait, she couldn't TVE or he'd be staked and beheaded by now okay, even if he had blocked her, what might the block tell her? Wouldn't a vampire block look, taste, smell? whatever, different than a human one? Or did Kun's passing include the shape of his mind to a mind search? But being able to block a mind search was illegal too. Ordinary humans couldn't do it. Which meant anyone who did wasn't an ordinary human. And if you know something, you know it. Even if you got that knowledge by prescribed means. 
like by trolling without authority. It wasn't my back that needed watching at this moment. It was Con's. As well as his front, sides, top, bottom, and any other attached bits. I stared at the window. In the lower corner nearer me there was a tiny gap where the blind didn't fit through. I was sure I could see light coming in. The goddess had her back to the window. She had a huge desk, of course, that sprawled in front of it, but it was a big room, and there was plenty of space for her minions and Pat and his lot plus Con and me. Her desk was empty. Even her com gear was all shut away in a wall closet. I knew this because one of her vassals folded the doors back and sat down in front of it. There was a lot of it. It looked like it would take up the entire wall if the doors were pushed back all the way. I was glad I wasn't a techie. If I'd understood any of what I could see, I would have been even more jittery than I already was. There were now fifteen of us. She'd only had three flunkies when we entered, but when it turned out she wasn't going to be able to get rid of Pat one of them muttered into her wire and four more people had entered almost as soon as she'd finished speaking, marching nearly in lockstep. The goddess must keep them in a cupboard right outside her door for those moments when she needed to oppress a situation quickly. Maybe she chose people who wanted to spend their off-duty hours folded up in a drawer too, the better for rapid retrieval. We faced each other over her desk, them and us. Con and I sat in two chairs about six feet apart. Pat, keeping up the pretense that we were under defensive surveillance, had a pair of people behind each of our chairs. He leaned against the wall behind us, but off to one side, near a con, I could see him out of the corner of my eye without turning my head. His wire squeaked at him periodically, occasionally he muttered back. Once I saw him jerk his head up and stare at us, con or me, I couldn't tell after some very agitated squeaking. I wondered what his field people might be telling him about what they were finding in the remains of No Town. I wasn't used to seeing Pat wearing a wire. He hadn't any time I'd seen him at Charlie's. He hadn't when I visited his office downstairs here. He hadn't even when we drove out to the lake. The wire made him look a lot more threatening. More like a regular member of SOF, the huge national agency dedicated to protecting humans against the other threat, which is one of its minor local operations had planted an illegal fetch on me. Even with a wire, Pat wasn't nearly as threatening as a vampire. Or as the goddess. Several of the flunkies' wires squeaked at them too. I saw them glancing at each other worriedly. Perhaps they always looked worried. Being the goddess flunky can't have been an easy job, even if you have the personality for it. The goddess paraded up and down behind her desk, occasionally leaning on it for emphasis, occasionally coming round to the front to sit on the edge and stare at us. She ignored everyone else. I thought I saw her glance at the window too. Okay, I could make a dive for Con the moment she touched the blind, but that would give two things away simultaneously, what he was. And what I could do. The air in the room seemed to press against my skull like a tightening vice. Maybe it was just the goddess. 
I looked at my hands. I thought I could see tiny filaments of green or black running up the backs of them, running up my arms, like gangrene spreading from the site of infection. I couldn't see any sign of the golden web, even though the blanket wrapped around me had rubbed a lot of the blood off. I could see only green and black. Death as an infection. The infection had begun five months ago. Maybe I'd already died back at Bo's headquarters, perhaps when the scar on my breast reopened and it hadn't quite caught up with me yet. Maybe Con had delayed the inevitable by making me offering me his blood to drink. Undead blood was used to keeping dead people moving, after all. So maybe it didn't matter if I gave myself away. I was worm fodder as soon as the green and black filaments reached my beating heart. It did matter. I would be giving Con away too. I'm very sorry, Con was saying to the goddess. I know how thin my story sounds. But there is nothing else to tell you. It was all very baffling to me, to Miss Seddon and me too. There was a little silence. I set my tea mug down on the floor, and groped in my pocket for my little knife, the knife that glowed with daylight even in the dark, the knife that burned Con if he touched it. I held it a moment before I pulled it out, wondering if I was dead, not undead. Con promised me I couldn't be turned, just dead, a new form of zombie perhaps, which would explain why my brain was refusing to work properly, why nothing seemed quite real, not even my fear. A zombie's brain always goes first, while sometimes their hearts go on beating. If I was dead, perhaps I couldn't save Con from the daylight anymore either. The knife was warm in my hand. Body heat. But zombies are usually cool. Like all the undead. My knife was warm like the touch of a friend, against my gangrenous hand. Suddenly there were tears in my eyes. Do zombies weep? I pulled the knife out. I made all the effort I was capable of, to be here, to be present, in this room, with Con and Pat and the Goddess of Pain. Pardon me, I said. I want to return your knife before I, er, uh, forget. I should have said something about why I was remembering now rather than at some other moment, why I had Mr. Connor's knife in the first place, but I couldn't think of anything. I was at the end of my thinking. It was taking all my energy to be here. And I didn't know that it would work. It was merely the only thing I could imagine to try. Con turned toward me. He almost forgot to be human. When I tossed him the knife his hand moved toward where it was going to be, I felt him check himself. He plucked the knife out of the air a little too neatly, but not impossibly so. Not inhumanly. He caught it, and closed his fingers around it, rested his hand on his knee. The knife had disappeared. If there was anything to see as it burned him, if it burned him, if it was still full of daylight of my sunshine, no one in the room would see. He set his tea mug down, so he still had one hand free. Thank you, he said, and turned back to the goddess as if for her next question. We had our one bit of luck then. There was a wire squeak so momentous, apparently, that one of the goddess minions risked whispering it to her, and she was distracted, perhaps, 
from this curious business of Mr. Connor's knife. She wasn't very happy about whatever news the minion gave her, whatever it was. Then she sighed, elaborately, as if releasing tension. As if asking everyone in the room to relax. I didn't relax. Con didn't, but then he was never relaxed, any more than he was ever tense. He was just there. Pat didn't relax. I couldn't see any of the rest of us. The minions didn't relax. I'm sure there is a regulation in their contract that forbids them to relax. The goddess looked around at us and smiled. It wasn't a very good smile. If I had to choose, I would say Con did it better. Well, she said. It has been a long night and everyone will be better for a rest. And you two warriors, she tried to make this sound unironical, but she failed according to the latest report, have been a part of the destruction of a major vampire sanctum, perhaps an instrumental part of that destruction. You must forgive what may appear to be my excessive zeal here tonight, but occurrences like this are rare, and SOF must know as much as possible about any event concerning the others, especially the darkest of the others, to be as effective as we can be. And we have found, over and over again, that the sooner we speak to any and all witnesses, the better. I would appreciate it if you would return, later, when you are rested, and fill out formal statements, which we can keep on file. I would also appreciate it if you would make yourselves available for further discussion, at some future time. Occasionally it has happened that witnesses do remember later what they were too shaken to comprehend at the time, perhaps as we learn more about what happened, some detail we can describe to you will loosen something in your memories, something we can use. You must see that to the extent it is possible you had a crucial role in tonight's events we must discover what that role was. And in the meanwhile, perhaps, she was moving as she spoke after the night that has passed, the light of morning will make us all feel better. With better she pulled the blind. Daylight, filtered by proof glass but unmistakably, undeniably daylight, fell full on Con. How long after sunlight touches him before a vampire burns? The stories say immediately, but what is immediately? One second. Ten. I sat still, rigidly still, my nerves shrieking. Con, of course, looked as he always looked, neither tense nor calm. Twenty seconds. Thirty. Surely thirty seconds was longer than immediately. What is the algebra of how long one live person with an affinity can protect one vampire from the effects of sunlight as compared to one small inanimate daylight charged pocket knife? Supposing that the person is still alive and the affinity is still functioning, the pocket knife still charged, and the fact that the vampire was presently passing for human didn't morph the process so that Con was about to collapse in a little heap of cold ashes with no gruesome intermediate stages. 40 seconds. 50. 60. That's good enough. I burst into tears and Con was up off his chair at once as immediately as the fire that hadn't come and kneeling beside mine, one hand on my shoulder. My blanket had fallen off. 
I felt my affinity yank itself from wherever it lived, somewhere around my heart apparently, and throw itself toward the shoulder he was touching. It was still there. Still live. I heard a rustle, like a sigh of leaves. Trees are impervious to dark magic. The hand that held my knife still hung by his side. It seemed to me that as a performance it wasn't too unlikely that he'd put his hand on my shoulder, after whatever it was that we'd been through together. Maybe we were calling each other Mr. Connor and Miss Seddon, but we'd come out of whatever it was holding hands. I turned my head and stared at him, into his leaf-green eyes, into the face of the monster I had saved, and been saved by probably too many times to count, now, any more, even by what he had called that which binds. Perhaps that was why I could feel my affinity working its way through his body, through the vessels that carried his blood, a special little squad of it racing down to his burnt hand. I put both my hands, my contaminated hands, on his shoulders, and leaned my head against him and wept and wept, and the warmth, the human-seeming warmth of his body through the tattered, filthy shirt against the palms of my hands felt the way my knife had felt, like the touch of a friend. The healing touch of a friend. I had meant to burst into tears, to break the scene, to give Con a chance to move and to put up his son Parasol sitting in the next chair, but it had been easy, too easy, and it was hard to stop crying, once I'd begun. It took me several minutes to get to the gulping and hiccuping stage, by which time all of Pat's people were rushing around holding boxes of tissues and bringing damp towels to wipe my face with and brandishing fresh cups of tea. The goddess and her people hadn't moved at all. She looked like a naturalist observing faulty ritual behavior, not at all what she had been led to believe was the norm for this species, but was therefore interesting precisely for that reason, and how could she turn it to her advantage? I didn't like it, but I'd worry about it later. Her people stood and sat around looking stuffed. Working for the goddess didn't encourage the acquisition of damp towel fetching skills. I would worry about it all later. I was getting used to the idea that I might have a later to worry about it in. Maybe. I was so tired. I had dropped my hands from Con's shoulders to juggle tea and towels and tissues. I looked at them, my hands, going about their usual business of grasping and manipulating. I couldn't see the green and the black anymore. But I couldn't see the gold either. I knew the seal was gone forever, and the chain, I couldn't feel the chain against my breast anymore although the reopened wound had stopped aching. Had I heard the rustle of leaves when Con touched my shoulder? Sun self, tree self, dear self. Don't they outweigh the dark self? Not anymore. I would worry about me later too. About my hands. I would ask Con. I hoped I would have a chance to ask Con. Because after I got him out of this daylight, our alliance was over. Con. He still knelt beside me. An ordinary man might have looked silly, doing nothing, but even as a relatively successful human facsimile he looked so unconventional. Unsummithing. Silly didn't come into it. Or maybe that was just how I saw him. It was day again, and Con was my responsibility, 
and we were surrounded by people who must continue to believe he was human. I looked at him. He'd dropped the yellow blanket when he left his chair. He looked better without it, even blood mottled and with his clothes hanging off him in sodden and dried stiff rags. Pardon me, Miss Seddon, but I think I must beg you to keep my knife for me a little longer. I don't believe any of my pockets have survived the night's encounters. He held it out to me, turning and opening his hand, the palm was unmarked. I felt that my affinity emergency squad was dancing around in some little used synapse somewhere, giving each other teeny microscopic high fives. I put down a towel and accepted the knife, slipping it awkwardly back into the pocket it had come out of. I was careful not to look at the goddess as I did this, as if it was just a little jackknife. I wondered if vampire clothing had pockets. What would vampires keep in pockets? Handkerchiefs. House keys. Charms against being grilled, so to speak, by angry, high-ranking SOF officers. I'd managed to move my chair a little during the commotion after I burst into tears. Con was safe for the moment, in shadow. I stood up and looked at the goddess. She was taller than I was, of course. There are spells to make you appear taller than whoever you are talking to, but they are expensive and all but the best have a nasty habit of revealing you as your real height the minute you turn your attention to someone else. I guess the goddess was just tall. I apologize for making a fuss, I said, as respectfully as I could. Maybe she was so accustomed to wreaking hostility from most of her colleagues and interviewees that she didn't register it anymore. Maybe she would assume I didn't like her because she'd intimidated me successfully. Well, she had. May we leave now, please? I continued, holding my poisonous hands out placatingly, palms up. I will come back whenever you like, but I'm so tired I can't think. And I want to bath. Several baths. And what I was wearing, the remains of what I was wearing, would sew into the trash. No, the bonfire. I would start running out of clothing soon if I wasn't careful. If I had a future it would have to include some shopping. She made gracious cooperation noises that were about as sincere as my respectfulness and we were allowed to leave, Con and I, and Pat and John and Theo and Kate and Mike. In the windowless hallway Con and I drifted nonchalantly apart. I was trying to remember if there were any unexpected windows around blind corners. I hadn't been at my best when we'd come through the first time. I wasn't at my best now, but against all odds. I was improving.